All right, this is 8.3 equilibrium. Um, the next two days, you're going to be doing the circular motion lab. Thursday, we'll do the review, and Friday will be the test, and then we'll move on to the last chapter for the semester. Yay. You guys don't seem excited about that. All right. Since this is the last section in the chapter, it's probably the harder section, so just be prepared. We're going to talk about a lot of, like, little things that cover stuff, and then um, we're going to do um, equilibrium, which is the hard stuff. So this is basically we're talking about center of mass and stability, rotating reference frames, the centrifugal force, or the centrifugal force, however you want to say it, and um, the Coriolis effect. Each one of those are pretty easy, just kind of like filler and stuff. And then we'll do equilibrium at the very end, and that is the hard stuff. So first of all, the centrifugal force, or centrifugal force, whatever you want to call it, that's fine. Um, it's a fictional force, and we have talked about this before. We just have to bring this back in because they're actually going to test you on this a little bit. And that is a um, force that you feel like you feel like there's a force pulling on you, but that's actually not what's happening. Um, the best way to describe it is imagine you're in a car, right? We've talked about this. You're in a car going on a circle. That's where your car is going. That's the direction. Um, the thing that keeps the car turning, right, is the friction between the road and the tires. So the frictional force, if it wasn't pulling us or, you know, acting uh, to the left here, then we wouldn't be able to turn our car, right, because there would be nothing to grip on and it would just go straight. Well, you are sitting in this car, and again, if there was no frictional force between you and the seat or the car door, if you're just like sitting on a, a flat thing, you would actually end up going with the tangential velocity or the <coughs> tangential velocity tangent to the circle going straight. So the car is basically turning out from underneath you. But since there's a friction between the seat and the car door that's keeping in there, you feel like you're being pulled to the outside <coughs> when you go around, when actually you're traveling straight and the car is running into you. Because the car is what has the force on it, not you. So this this um, for, this force, this feeling of being to the outside, it's really just inertia, but we call it the centrifugal force or centrifugal force. And it's not really a real force. So we have two different types. We have the, uh, the real force that's actually acting on you, or acting on the car. So the centripetal force is actually... Um, and that can be the friction between you and the seat that's causing you to move as well, or the car door that's pushing against you, or your seat belt. All those things are real forces that are causing you to go around the circle. But you still feel like you're going to the outside with this fake force, the centrifugal force, and it's fake. Notice the F. It is not a real force. It is only an apparent force. Does that say BT? Uh, yes, for tangential velocity. So basically, if you draw this picture, you should be fine. You don't really need to write the notes down. Explain. rotating reference frame. So basically, if I let something go, right, um, the Earth is going to move out from underneath it when it lands. So it's actually not really going in a straight path, or it's not going to appear to go in a straight path, even though it is. So if I let go of something, it shouldn't come straight back down. But um, the Earth, you know, we're all in a rotating re reference frame. 
So we'd have to throw it really, really, really high up or really, really, really far. So it have to be in the air for a very long time. And what's going to happen is basically um, the Earth is going to curve out from underneath it and make it feel like it's not going in a straight path from our point of view. It'll look like it actually swerved this way. When we're sitting on the Earth, so as the Earth turns, the Earth's turning out from underneath that straight path. But since we're on the Earth, it looks bent. So... Um, it's not really a big deal to think about these rotating reference frames. It doesn't affect us that much because we're not throwing things up really high. I mean, I mean, as hard as you could throw, it's still not going to be high enough or up long enough for the Earth to curve out from underneath it. But if we had like a um, maybe a satellite or a nuclear missile that we were trying to throw out, then we could actually have problems with that. Um, so this rotating reference frame, again, because it's an accelerated reference frame, it's constantly changing direction. And as soon as this object leaves that rotating reference frame, it's not under the same influences. Again, not super important yet. We still have Newton's laws here because, again, we're not throwing things up very high. Um, and it's very, very small effects that it would have on this because, again, it's like not even a millimeter off. All right, so um, let's talk about the Coriolis force. Again, it's not a real force. It is a big force, an apparent force. And it's the force that, um, and there's a couple of different ways the Coriolis force is actually um, affects us, you know, how we talk about it. The first one is imagine you're on a merry-go-round. And your friend is over here, and you are right here. And your friend <coughs> throws a ball straight towards you. <coughs> it would hit you, yes. Okay. Except that now the merry-go-round is moving. Uh, so when the when the ball leaves the the friend's hand, it leaves that accelerated reference frame, this rotating reference frame. So you actually end up over here, and the ball ends up right here. But from your point of view, it looks like the ball was headed straight at you and then curves away. So it looks like there's a force on the ball actually making it curve when what's actually happening is because you were on the merry-go-round, you just moved away from the path of the ball. Yeah, but if you actually see it happen, it actually looks like the ball goes like this and then curves away. From an outside point of view, from like the cat that's sitting over here watching you, because it's a creepy cat, Um, it sees that the ball goes straight. But from your point of view, it looks like the ball went, turned sideways. It's a messed up cat. It's hard to draw with these big expo pens. Okay, so that's one way the Coriolis a force can be applied. And again, it's not a force actually on the ball. It's just, it's an apparent force. It's not really acting on the ball. The ball's still going straight. You just curved away from the cat. Good. We seem like we understand that one. All right, here's a terrible picture of some um, merry-go-round things. They're terrible. No, I'm trying to not trying to visualize All right, the next one is the Coriolis force due to the Earth. This is what I was trying to talk about when you like throw something up in the air. Imagine that we've actually thrown a cannonball up. Straight up. Well, the Earth is moving, right? So the longer it's in the air, the more it's going to be off because the ball is actually going straight up. But the Earth moves, right? It's going to move this way, this this way, and so it'll actually land on a different spot. It actually curves. It looks like its path curves from Earth's perspective, but the ball is actually going straight. It's just the Earth moved out from under it, making the target off. So you always, if, if you were like launching nuclear missiles or whatever, you would have to um, account for the fact that the Earth is going to move while you're up in the air. Because the Earth is constantly spinning. Okay, are we okay with that one? Yeah, all right. 
So now this is the more important one. I'm sorry. Was I not? Not that important. This is more important. Okay. Um, the Coriolis and force and weather. Now you think there's actually these forces driving the weather. Well, that's not quite true. Um, how do we explain this? Yes. All right. Here's the Earth. <laughs> Now the Earth is rotating, right? It's rotating this way. And since it's rotating this way, it has air on it, right? It has atmosphere. And there's nothing like tethering the atmosphere to the surface of the Earth. So as the Earth spins, the air wants to stay where it's at. But according, you know, from our point of view, it seems like the air is rushing this direction, right? And it's not that the air is moving, it's that the Earth is rotating. But actually, that, that drives, and that powers, along with the sun, um, that drives wind belts. Because if it's going this way, it can't all be going this way. So some of it's got to go back in that direction, and some of it's going to go back in that direction. So we end up with what you call the jet stream. If you look at Saturn or Jupiter, it has stripes on it, right? Those are wind belts. But they've got so much dust in their atmosphere that actually you end up seeing different colors. So you actually see the stripes in the planets. That is also from the Coriolis effect. And that's because the planet is spinning and the air wants to stay still, but then, you know, it's moving. And then you have the sun and all of that power. Okay, now this is also true for um, the, er the currents, right? So let's pretend that this is a planet and it has masses, land masses. Like, you know, something like that. And then you got that country over there. It's like Europe or something. Okay, good. You guys got my visual so far? All right, so the um, again, the Earth moves, and so the water's going to go in that, that direction because the Earth is moving, except for it hits floor, right? And it goes up, and it goes up here, and then it goes up, and then it comes back down, right? And down here, it goes like this. And it goes like that. Okay, so why do hurricanes always um, go I don't know this is, um, clockwise in the north? Because of this. Because that is the way the ocean currents are going, and that's the way the wind belts are going. So in the north, we get hurricanes that spin this way, and in the south, we get typhoons that spin that way. And it all has to do with this Coriolis effect, the fact that the water wants to be still, but the earth is moving out from underneath it. And that's what drives our currents and our um, wind belts. You guys don't seem very excited about this. I think this stuff is fascinating. Okay. Uh, what's the northern light? Uh, that is an interaction of electrically charged particles from the sun interacting with our magnetic field. We will learn about that. Isn't there something called the Coriolis effect? They're like crazy. That's what we were just talking about. Yeah, what is it? No, we didn't say effect. Yep, that's what it's called. Coriolis. Back All right, this is my first clicker question. They are spread out. Don't get too excited. We're not done yet. Question one says, a person standing on the edge of a rotating platform feels an outward pull. What would the person call the force pulling on him to the outside? <laughs> the centrifugal. Here's question two. Hello? Sure. Mariah, you're getting checked out. 
All right, question two. A person standing on the edge of a rotating platform feels an outward pull. What's the actual force acting on him? The actual force acting on him, still missing like seven people. would be the friction between him and the platform, which is um, towards the center, being center-seeking, making it the centripetal force. All right, so let's move on. You guys are so ADD today. All right, the center of mass. We talked a little bit about this on Friday. The center of mass is the um, point where the particle, basically all the, what the particle is going to rotate around. Um, for instance, this is a uniform density object, meaning it's pretty much the same material all the way through. So it's going to rotate about its center, right? So if I threw this at you, it's going to rotate about its center. Um, let's see, what else we got here? We got this object. It's a nice circle. It's going to rotate. Its center of mass is actually like right here, even though there's no mass there. It's still going to rotate about that point. So if I threw it at you again, it's going to rotate about this point. Uh, now this, much heavier. So our center of our mass, our center of mass here, since it's a little bit heavier on this side because it has the binding on the book, it's going to be just a little bit more towards it. Because it's got more mass, right? Oh, center okay. of mass. Since there's more mass on this side, it's going to shift just a little bit. That's probably no, it's okay. Um, so if we throw this object, whatever that object might, might be, the center of mass is going to move on a straight line. So even though in this picture the wrench has more mass, so the center of mass is here, it's going to rotate about that center of mass, so the center of mass is straight. <coughs> okay, in order to find this um, center of mass, you're going to take the object and you're going to hang it. Now this isn't too terribly important because I'm not going to make you do this, but you know if you ever needed to know, you're taking, draw a straight line down. Take another spot, draw a straight line down. Where they intersect, that is going to be the center of mass. But we have a three-dimensional object, so you actually have to do it again. And for this one, since it's three-dimensional, you have to do it like right in, like in between, like from another dimension. And then that third point will tell you exactly three dimensions where it would be located. Again, you won't have to do that. So you don't really need to write it down. No. Why do you tell me this after I started? Mm -hmm. Move on. Well, I told you that equilibrium is at the end. We're almost there. Well, doing that in my own life, I finished it. This is a different type of equilibrium. Oh man, that was easy. This is a little bit different. Okay. Um. Here is some pictures of objects. We don't need to worry about that. There we go. Stability. And in this case, we have our center of mass. That is going to basically tell us how stable something is. So if I show you two different pictures, for instance, here's one object, and here's another object. Which one's going to be more stable, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left. The one on the left. Why? Good. The center of mass is in the center. How about, let's do one more. Which one is more stable? Still the center. Just kidding, I think you changed it. The one on the bottom? The one on the bottom, right? The one on the far left. Um, this one is going to be more stable because it has a lower center of gravity. 
Um, actually, there's an interesting thing that you can do. Um, no, I'm not going to. Never mind. That's going to take too long. Okay, so you can see that the basically the fatter the triangle is, the more stable it is. Um, and what's also interesting is if you start to tip this thing, as soon as, as the center of mass crosses over the um, base right here, it's going to tip. So in this case, you see how this center of mass is over the tip of this point? It's going to fall to the right. And then I got a couple more stability problems. So in this one, this one's very stable. It's um, got a center of mass right here. It is in, in between the two base points. At this point, it is perfectly balanced over the corner. This is why if you put a little bit of um, liquid in a soda can and put it on just the edge, it's going to stay there. But as soon as you get more soda into the can, um, then it's going to fall because now the center of mass is over the base. So in this case, it's going to fall. Yes, so you go back. And apparently, as I said in the last class period, and they all laughed, and it took me a little bit to figure out why. It's all about the base. <laughs> okay. I, I've said that many, many times in the last couple of years that I've been teaching, and I never had a reaction until this year and that stupid song came out. So the lower the center of mass, the wider the base, the more stable your object is going to be. So that's like, I guess when football players, they go to get, you know, hit, they get tackled, they get lower their center of base, they get, they get down, makes them more stable. I don't know anything about football. But. No? Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's why, I don't know if you've ever ridden in a Jeep, but at the top they say rollover risk. <coughs> the reason they have a rollover risk is because they have a higher center of mass. So if you're driving like um, sports cars, right, sports cars have very low center of mass, so when they go around the bank turns, they're still fine, they're not going to flip over. But if you did that with a van or a truck or a semi, they have a higher center of mass. So at some point, if it gets high enough, if the angle gets high enough, it can tip over. I don't think that that would be funny. <laughs> I think it's like one of those things that you can't look away, but it's so sad that it happened. All right, here goes the hard stuff. Right here, and I'm running out of time. only got 10 minutes to do this problem, which is not good. Static equilibrium. This is where um, both the velocity is zero and the angular velocity is zero, which means it's not moving and it's not rotating. In order for these two um, conditions, it must satisfy these two conditions to be in static equilibrium. It needs to have a net force and a net torque of zero. Now, it is possible to be in equilibrium that's not static equilibrium if you're not rotating and moving at a constant velocity because you have the zero um, acceleration. That would be fine. But for all your problems, we're going to do static equilibrium where it's not moving and it's not rotating. So these two things, the only thing you really need to know about this is that, um, mm, let's do this, the net force is zero and the net torque is zero. That's pretty much all you need to write down for static equilibrium because we're going to do a problem. You guys ready for your problem? Okay. This problem is page 215, number 37 in your homework. So if you write this all down, you'll have a homework question done. Um, it says a 7.3 kilogram ladder that is 1.92 meters long rests on two sawhorses. Um, on sawhorse A, which is on the left, it is 0 0.30 meters from the end. And sawhorse B is located on the right side. It is 0.45 meters from the end. 
And when you choose your axis of rotation for torque, which I'll show you how to do that, um, make it in the center where the center of mass is. All right, what is the 7.3 kilograms? Mass. Mass, good. And what's the 1.92 meters? It's length. It's the length of the ladder, so I'm going to put an L there. Um, then I have this 0 0.3 meters. What's that? It's, it's kind of a radius. It's the radius. It's the, the length from the end. So I'm tentatively going to call it RA, but it's not really RA, and I'll show you why. And then I have the 0 0.45 meters. What's that? RB. Yeah, for the most part, we'll call it RB, but again, it's not quite right. Um, equilibrium problems deal with net force and net torque, so we need to draw a free body diagram. So, yes. Here's our ladder, and our ladder has some sort of weight. It's being supported by sawhorse A and sawhorse B. Why is the ladder not falling down? Where, what forces are there that are keeping it up? Gravity. Well, gravity is where you got that one. What's, what's keeping it up? Sawhorse A, right? Sawhorse A and Sawhorse B. And Sawhorse B, good. So there's my free body diagram for my ladder. Okay, we're okay with that? That's not too bad? Okay, I'm going to start with the um, first one here. Are there any forces in the X direction, left or right? No. No. So we're not going to use that one. Now we're going to use this one, which is nice and easy. Equals zero. So we're going to add up all our forces in the Y direction. We have FA up, MG down, and FB up. FB. So we don't know FA, but we do know the mass is 7.3 and gravity is 9.8. So plus FB gives us zero. Wait, wait, how do you know, how do you know what's in the Y direction? Up and down. What's up and down? MG is going down. Yep. Which is why she's subtracting. Up and down. Okay. Um, so this is 71.54. So we have FA plus FB equals 71.54. And it's actually it's Newton's, but you don't need any yet. Okay. We can simplify this a little bit more if we wanted to solve for FA or FB, which we'll do, but we don't need to do it right now, so we'll just wait. Any questions on getting up to this point? No, just up to this point. Okay, um, so the next thing we need to do, so we did this, we're good with that, now we need to do the torque. Um, and it says in the problem, to use the um, center of mass right in the middle. So this is going to be our pivot point. Now, remember that torque is FR sine theta. So every force is going to have a torque. And this one we don't really need because it's at the pivot point. So it's R is going to be zero. So you can ignore that one. So our first one is going to be we have a torque A and a torque V. Now, I didn't put adding or subtracting yet because they have to have direction, right? Just like this one has direction, that one has direction. So if this is the pivot point, which way is force A going? Clockwise. Clockwise. So force A or torque A is going to be negative. And if this is the pivot point, which way is going to push, is force B going to push the ladder? Counterclockwise, making it possible. That's probably a tricky part. Just might want to start that. Okay, so now we need to apply this torque equation, which is F R sine theta. So we're going to have F A R A sine theta, A if you want, um, negative, plus force B R B sine theta B equals zero. Uh, now, these angles are 90 degrees, so since they are 90, they're going to go, sine is going to go to 1, so you can ignore that. Now, this RA and RB, why can't we use the RA and RB that we labeled in our problem? Why aren't these correct? 
Why can't I use these? Because they're not really it. They're from the end, right? This is um, 0.3 and this is 0.45. And we need from the pivot point. We're looking for this and this. This should go all the way there. All right, and now the whole thing is 1.92. So what's half of 1.96? So that means this is 0.96 and this is 0.96. So what is this and what is this? Yeah, 0.66, good. 0 0.51. So this will be our RA, this is the actual RA, and this is our actual RB. So let's plug that in. We have negative force A times our real RA, which is 0.66, plus force B, which we don't know, times RB of 0 0.51 equals 0. Okay, so now I have two equations with two unknowns. You can use substitution or elimination. Elimination is a little bit difficult here, so I'm going to do substitution for you really quick. I know it's going to be really quick. I'm, um, we're almost out of time. That's why I'm going so fast. So we'll do FB equals 71.54 minus FA. I'm going to take this and plug it in where there's an FB. We have negative FA times 0 0.66 plus 71.54. Minus FA times 0.51 equals 0. Make sure you distribute your 0.51 to both of these. So 71.54 times 0.51 gives you 36.5 minus 0.51 FA plus 0.66 FA. All right. Um, 0. 0.51 plus 0.66. 1.17 is negative. That's FA plus 36.5 giving you 0. 36.5 equals 1.17 FA. Giving you 32. 31.2, I'm sorry. equals FA. So now we solve for FA. We can go in, plug it in here. So this is 71.54 minus 31.2 and that'll give us FB. And that gives us our answers. Don't forget your units. 